Okay, thanks everyone for coming for our first colloquium of the semester. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Katie Bowman. Katie Bowman is a Rosenberg scholar and an assistant professor in the computing and mathematical sciences, electrical engineering and astronomy departments at Caltech. Before joining Caltech, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. She received her PhD in the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT in EECS. Before coming to MIT, she received her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan. The focus of her research is on using emerging computational methods to push the boundaries of interdisciplinary imaging. So we're so honored to have you here today and whenever you're ready, please. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for um, inviting me today. I'm really looking uh, forward to telling you a little bit about some work that I've been doing uh, in the last, uh, uh, I guess for a number of years, but also in the last kind of year um, during my time at Caltech. Um, and I'm also looking forward to chatting with uh, some of you later today uh, after the talk and also um, throughout some time tomorrow. So today I'm gonna uh, tell you all about, uh, uh, well, tell you about imaging black holes. And um, black holes are, you know, one of the most mysterious phenomena in the universe and scientists have been studying them ever since they were first predicted uh, from Einstein's theory of general relativity just over 100 years ago. In particular, for decades, scientists have been studying the giant elliptical galaxy at the head of the Virgo constellation. And this galaxy, called M87, is 55 million light years away from us and very special. And that's because over 100 years ago, someone discovered a streak of light on the sky, which ended up being this galactic scale jet of plasma that was shooting out of the core of the galaxy and marking the spot of a supermassive black hole. And so over decades, scientists have tried to develop better and better instruments to try to study the supermassive black hole to be at the, predicted to be at the center. And then in April of 2017, an Earth-sized telescope hooked up together and collected the data necessary to take the first picture of a black hole. Uh, two years later, after processing the data, this is what we saw. This black hole image uh, required an international collaboration of scientists from all around the world to build the instruments and algorithms uh, necessary to make it possible, including many people uh, from the University of Arizona. So our previous project scientist, uh, Dimitrio Saltis, actually is faculty at Arizona, along with uh, many other scientists in this photo and also uh, some that missed this photo as well. And so today I wanna to tell you a very abridged story of how we were able to capture a picture of a black hole um, and there are many different angles to the story, so many different pieces. So I hope to give you a, a glimpse into kind of the primary contribution of the story um, that I kind of contributed to, and that's how imaging was done and validated. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about techniques that are currently being developed at my group at Caltech to push the Event Horizon Telescope past its current limits to see things, to see environments still invisible to us. In particular, I'm gonna be talking today about new machine learning approaches my group has been developing for doing uncertainty quantification of images, um, uh, as well as how we are developing machine learning methods to optimize the placement of the next telescope to be built into the Earth-sized telescope array. So the first question you might ask is, how are we able to take a black hole, a picture of a black hole that by definition doesn't let light escape? So, you know, it should be kind of unseeable. And while light propagating near a black hole, it, it doesn't actually follow straight lines. It's curved because the black hole is curving space time. And so photons can even go in complete circles around it. And the space around a black hole is lit up by this hot gas, this hot plasma spinning around. It's heated to hundreds and billions of degrees. And so it releases uh, uh, this emission and you have photons flying around everywhere. Some of these photons fall into the black hole but other ones just graze it so that they're bent by the black hole's gravitational pull. The net effect being that the black hole casts a shadow on the bright surrounding emission um, that is nearly circular. And if Einstein was right about general relativity, this light would be bent into a ring whose size and whose shape tell us about the mass and the spin of the black hole. And this ring is referred to as the black hole shadow because we're seeing kind of the imprint of the black hole on this hot gas. Here is kind of a more realistic simulation of what we would expect to see if we could see at about a one millimeter wavelength and we could see the black hole with really high resolution. Um, uh, this is a, a, a simulation. Okay, so at first glance, taking you know, the picture uh, maybe doesn't seem, you know, we could see the imprint of the black hole, but still 
being able to take this picture seems nearly impossible. And that's because the size of this ring is incredibly small. It's about 40 micro arc seconds in size, which is about the same size as a grain of sand. But when that grain of sand is in New York, and I'm viewing it from where I am in uh, Los Angeles at Caltech. And so it turns out taking a picture of something that small is very typical. As many of you know, it all comes down to the limits of diffraction. And so if we plug in the wavelength and required angular resolution necessary to see that black hole shadow into the diffraction limit equation, we can calculate that in order to see the black hole ring, we need to build a telescope 13 million meters across, or essentially the size of the Earth. And if we could build this Earth-sized telescope, we could just start to make out that distinctive ring of light indicative of the black hole's event horizon. Okay, well, obviously building a single dish telescope the size of the Earth isn't possible, but by joining telescopes located around the world, I've been working as part of the International Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration that built the first computational telescope the size of the Earth capable of resolving structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon for the first time. And joining telescopes in this manner is uh, called very long baseline interferometry, or VLBI. Uh, so how does this computational telescope work? Well, the Event Horizon Telescope is composed of telescopes from around the world that were actually originally built for other purposes. So by installing specialized equipment at each site, uh, many of which the work is done by people at Arizona, uh, by installing this uh, equipment at each site and linking the signals through the precise timing of atomic clocks, we've been able to make these originally disjoint telescopes actually work together. Uh, and teams of researchers at each of the telescopes, you know, we travel to the telescopes and then we essentially freeze the light by recording petabytes of data. And then we bring it all together and we use our computers to act like the lens and make that final picture. And so how do how do we bring it, that, all that information together? Well, unlike in a regular camera, in the Event Horizon Telescope, we don't capture the picture in pixel space, but instead in its frequency space. So we essentially take measurements of the black hole images Fourier transform. And if we put telescopes all across the globe, if we tiled the globe in telescopes, we would sample all these spatial frequency measurements. We'd sample every, me every measurement we need. But since we only have telescopes at a few locations, that means we only get a sparse number of measurements. And so it turns out that for every two telescopes in our telescope array, we obtain a single measurement of the underlying image's 2D spatial frequency that is related to the projected baseline between the telescopes. Each of these measurements, so this is a point on that frequency plane, each of those measurements is complex. So it's described by two numbers, right? It's amplitude and it's phase, which it's just handy to, to remember this for later. Okay, so in 2017, when we observed the black holes, uh, the black hole M87, we had eight different telescopes that were part of the EHT, but actually of those eight, only five of them were able to see the black hole in M87 and we're at different locations. So that would be only five, choose two points. That's only 10 points that we'd have to try to make an, an image from which is an incredibly small number of data constraints. But as the Earth rotates, we actually obtain other new measurements. So since the projected baselines between telescopes change as the Earth rotates, this amounts to carving out these different elliptical paths in the spatial frequency plane, where telescopes that are close together uh, give us information about the broad structure in the image. And so to get the fine detail we need to see that ring, we put our telescopes really far apart. Okay, so, so what do we do? Uh, how do we get those measurements? So we get these measurements, as I said, by recording, recording hundreds of terabytes of data at every telescope. Here's my friend, Lindy Blackburn, posing with about half a petabyte of data that we collected at just the LMT telescope one year. And this wasn't even all the data that we collected that, uh, that one year. And so we recorded so much data, we can't send it over the internet and we actually have to fly it to a common location. And then at that location, we use a special purpose supercomputer called the correlator to combine the precisely timed data. And then once this is done, this is passed onto a calibration stage, which finds weak signals hidden in the correlator output, tunes parameters to extract a stronger signal. And developing the algorithms that, uh, uh, to do this calibration was a huge task that required uh, 
many new algorithms to be developed for the kind of messy event horizon telescope data we have to deal with. But once we got these measurements, uh, uh, how do we actually try to make an image? Well, at this point, we have this data and we can kind of abstract the astrophysics from the problem and look at it as a purely mathematical uh, computational imaging problem. We have sparse data and our challenge is to find that image that caused that. And if we were met, given measurements that covered the entire frequency plane, we you know, tiled the globe in telescopes. And we, in, in, in the case of no noise, it would be trivial. Because in the case of no noise, you would just simply need to apply an inverse Fourier transform to the measurements to recover back the image. But since we only see a few samples, there are therefore an infinite number of possible images that are perfectly consistent with the data we measure. And on top of that, the fact that there's a different and quickly changing atmosphere above every telescope across the globe causes our data to be very noisy and the problem is even more ill-posed. So what does this noise look like? I, I'd like to explain a little bit about how noise enters the system because it informs how we go about approaching the reconstruction task. So the whole reason the interferometry, the uh, radio interferometry, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope works in the first place is due to the fact that light from the black hole, it's gonna to travel to Earth for 55 million years, and then it's gonna reach one of the telescopes slightly before the other one. And this time delay is key for extracting that 2D spatial frequency measurement that's used for image reconstruction. But when you have a telescope in Chile and one in Hawaii and one in Spain, they all have different atmospheres above them, and each atmosphere causes a random phase, a, a random delay in the received signal, a propagation delay, which leads to an additional random phase delay in each frequency measurement. And similarly, this atmosphere also causes different attenuation factors in the signal, causing a changing absolute gain term. And so this error is really challenging because although ideally we would measure this nice, beautiful Fourier component, the italicized V here on the right, in reality, we have a completely random phase error and sometimes a pretty bad amplitude error as well. And so that's pretty terrible because at first glance, we've lost both our amplitude and phase information. And so if you've lost both amplitude and phase for every measurement, you know, what really do you have left to work with? But we get kind of lucky. And that's because our measurement term uh, actually contains some structure to it. So if you look at the measurement term, you might notice that these corrupting terms are site-based but every measurement we make actually comes from two telescopes. So if we have a third telescope, then the measurements that are formed with that third telescope share some of the same corrupting terms, G2 and Phi2. So we can design imaging algorithms to try to take advantage of this redundant corruption when solving for our images. And essentially, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, phase retrieval problems, we're essentially solving a constrained phase retrieval problem. And to do this, we developed two different kinds of classes of imaging algorithms to tackle it. The first class of algorithms is based on very standard methods used in the radio um, interferometry community, uh, methods used uh, for decades, in fact, called clean with an iterative self-calibration loop. And this is a very traditional method used in, in the community, which is a huge plus because it's vetted uh, within uh, by astronomers and well understood. Uh, but the disadvantage is that it was really built for arrays that have more telescopes or better calibration. And so that means when using the approach with the Event Horizon Telescope data, it often can be sensitive enough that you really need a significant amount of guidance from a knowledgeable user to get a good result. A second approach uh, is a class of methods that we've been developing more recently uh, called regularized maximum likelihood. And, 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 and these are uh, inspired by Bayesian kind of uh, methods, uh, Bayesian optimization methods. And in this method, we don't try to find an inverse function that takes us directly from the measurement to a picture, but instead we try to find a picture that both fits the measurements and is what is defined as likely through some um, image regularizer or, uh, or prior term. And so the disadvantage here is that we have to define what is a likely image and that introduces bias. Uh, but the huge advantage of these methods is that we can naturally incorporate other types of error. Um, for instance, we can try to directly optimize for an image with data constraints 
that are insensitive to that atmospheric air that I just described earlier. And so these different methods kind of have their, their different pros and cons to them. Um, but I want to briefly just summarize uh, kind of the general approach of the regularized maximum likelihood um, because it will kind of help in, in, um, in kind of uh, stuff I'll talk about down the line. So as I said before, there is an infinite number of solutions that are equally likely in terms of the measurement likelihood. But of the images that are consistent with the measured data, there are some images that are going to be more likely than others. And therefore, our goal becomes to find an image that doesn't just fit the data, but is actually likely under some sort of model of likely images. And so using this idea, we incorporate what we call this image prior that essentially scores the images. And so by solving for an image that maximizes both the data likelihood and the prior, we can whittle down from the infinite possibilities to get a single image that we think is likely and, um, and fits the data well, even in the presence of, uh, of lots of crazy noise. And just because it's going to come in handy later, I want to show you know mathematically what this looks like. Uh, we're solving an optimi at a very high level. We're solving this optimization problem where we're trying to find an image x that maximizes the posterior probability uh, 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 of the image x um, given the observed measurements. And by simply rewriting this using uh, Bayes' rule, we can see that maximizing this log uh, posterior probability is equivalent to maximizing the sum over the data likelihood and log image prior. Those two terms that I kind of just discussed in a hand wavy way. Okay, but note that when we do image reconstruction, we always have to be really cautious. And that's because any imaging method we come up with, whether it's a traditional approach, a fancy new machine learning approach, whatever we come up with, it's always gonna require that we inject some additional information into the problem about what images look like to recover something back in the end. And that always is going to bias our final picture. We can't get away from bias. And so we, but we want to be really careful that we understand the bias. So we don't want to even, you know, accidentally subconsciously have a preference for ring images and then be super excited we recover a ring back in the end. And so that meant a big question we dealt with, we faced with when um, dealing with the M87 black hole data was not just how to make an image, but how do we verify that what we are reconstructing with our imaging algorithms is real? And we tackled this uh, through a multi-step process. In our first step, in, we wanted to avoid shared human bias. So to do this, we tried to assess common features among independent reconstructions. And in order to get those independent reconstructions, we split ourselves into teams. So we split about 40 people who worked on imaging into four teams that span the earth. And these four teams were actually, when we first got the data of M87, we said, you know, go in with your respective teams, lock yourselves in your rooms and work to try to get your best image of the data without talking to the other teams. And so we worked in isolation with our teams trying to make the best image of the data from the data for seven weeks. And then after seven weeks, we all gathered together and we revealed the images to one another. And this is what we saw. So to me, this was really quite amazing because uh, although each picture was different, they all reconstructed the same basic structure, a ring of roughly 40 micro arc seconds, brighter on the bottom than the top. And seeing these images brought a whole other level of confidence to our results because we found the same basic structure, no matter what person or, uh, or, or method reconstructed the data. Every person is gonna have different biases Every method is going to have different kinds of uh, biases, whether they're, they're implicit or explicit. And so this uh, independent reconstructions at least allowed us to help avoid shared human bias. But we still wanted to make sure that we weren't, you know, all of us really wanting that ring image. We, we, we were probably all still subconsciously imposing some human bias. And so uh, to try to understand if this ring was robust, we spent the next couple of months essentially trying to break our images. And that led to the next step, where we tried to objectively choose image parameters to remove humans from the loop as much as possible. And so to do this, we developed three different imaging pipelines. You can actually download these pipelines along with the actual M87 data online, so you can run these methods yourself, uh, improve our methods, develop your own. Uh, you, 
all the information is there and feel free to ping me if you have any questions. Um, all of these approaches though, um, you know, all the different approaches that I've talked about all have their individual knobs on them, uh, hyperparameter settings. And these hyperparameters are usually tuned by a human user. But instead of having a human tune them, we instead said, well, let's try to search for the best set of knobs to recover different kinds of source structures. And so for instance, we generated synthetic data as if the Event Horizon Telescope were actually seeing a disk on the sky with no hole in the center. So we have this simulator that can simulate uh, Event Horizon Telescope measurements. We could plug in an image and say, this is synthetic data we might get. And so then once we had this data, we could try to find the best set of parameters from these imaging methods to recover that disk shape. And then when transferring these exact measure, uh, parameters onto the actual M87 data, we found that although we had tried our hardest to find parameters that recovered a disk with no hole in the center, our algorithm still required us to put that hole in there when using the real data. And by doing this simple training and testing procedure on different kinds of underlying sources that we thought could trick us, we saw that our methods always preferred that ring shape. And that was true no matter the day we observed M87 on or the imaging code we used to reconstruct it. And so by blurring the images from different imaging pipelines to an equivalent resolution, we then averaged them together to form the image that we showed to the rest of the world on April 10th. Uh, this ring, uh, uh, April 10th of 2019, this ring of, of light surrounding a black hole, uh, roughly 40 micro arc seconds in size and brighter on the bottom than the top. But once we had made these images, we still weren't sure. And so we went through a number of different validation tests. Um, we did a lot of these. I'm, you know, there's lots of them and, and even entire papers devoted to kinds of different types of validation. Um, I'm only very briefly going to talk about one test we did. Um, and but you, you're, you know, feel free to ping me if you have questions on, on the other tests in the papers. So previously, I talked about how we selected one set of parameters beta that perform best on synthetic data. But why should there only be one hyperparameter settings? that we should consider. You know, in fact, when you do large parameter surveys over the hyperparameter settings, we found that there are often many parameters that perform reasonably well on synthetic data. So instead of selecting just one set of betas, we instead selected a threshold and found all the beta parameters that performed above this, this threshold on the synthetic data. And so for instance, for one of the pipelines, we ran hundreds of thousands of different simulations and we found we had about 1500 parameters that we deemed acceptable um so so as you see we can instead of just selecting one beta we select a, the, all those and then we apply those to the actual m87 uh data uh so for example here is a slice of two of the parameters that we searched over and the green boxes are showing, showing a selection of the images that we identified as reasonable through tests on different types of synthetic data. And then once we had these images, about 1500 for the um, EHT imaging parameter survey, we could look across them for variations. The standard deviation tells us across those images where we had less certainty in the, uh, in the flux of the image. And you can see along the ring, uh, there are regions where we have less certainty. This turns out to be because of the interplay between the source size and the side lobes in our point spread function. Um, but one thing to note is that although, you know, we don't, there is some regions with less certainty along the ring, if you look at that standard deviation and compare it to the flux of the image, so if you look at the fractional standard deviation, we have a lot of faith in that ring. It appears in basically all the images that we reconstructed with different parameter settings, but what we don't believe is all that kind of wispy structure on the outside. So, you know, take that with a huge grain of salt. So our goal here is to use this image to extract science, right? And we can characterize uh, uncertainty of image features that lead to different science deliverables. For instance, uh, um, we used uh, the collaboration used simple methods to recover the ring diameter. Um, and once we uh, did this for all the different kinds of recovered images that we got, we could compare the diameters we got across different images with different beta parameters and also across different days. And when we did this, we found across different methods, we got very consistent parameters, uh, ring diameter. Um, when we compared across different um, methods of uh, recovering images and across different days, they all kind of gave you the, us the ri a ring size that was roughly the same of around 40 to 42 micro arc seconds. 
And so this is one way, that, uh, uh, another way that we can become confident in not just the images, but also the features of the image that we're recovering. But I wanna strongly highlight that what we're doing here was probing different modeling choices and seeing how those modeling choices affected our results. So in the regularized maximum likelihood problem, we were essentially changing something like our prior term and seeing how that prior affected the results. And this is definitely something that's important to explore because we do have a lot of uncertainty in what that prior should be. What is a likely black hole image? We didn't wanna constrain ourselves too much. But it's also important to note that this is not a posterior distribution. So going forward, it would be great if we could efficiently explore uncertainty, not only due to the prior, but also due to the data fit. In other words, we would love to be able to sample from our posterior distribution directly under a fixed prior assumption and see how this affects our results. But how should we go about doing that? Well, one natural approach would be to use something like a Mark Markov chain Monte Carlo method, some kind of sampling method. And we do have done this, for instance, we didn't just estimate the diameter of the ring from the recovered images, we also fit crescent or ring models directly to the data. Uh, and so this is a simulation showing the optimization of a sampling framework, where it's trying to fit a simple crescent model to the data. And when you do this, um, the, the, um, the, the members, the scientists who did this got around 40, uh, 40 to 42 micro arc seconds. So it's also these modeling fits were also very consistent with the images that uh, we produced. And using these approaches, we also got not just best ring fits, but also posteriors over the ring parameters. However, this is only fitting a very few parameters of the ring. And it's very challenging to scale up these, uh, these methods, these sampling methods to capture posteriors of images that are very high dimensional. And so to tackle this, we've been developing new methods for efficient posterior exploration by exploiting learning machinery. And so this is a little bit of an aside, but I wanna show you some more recent work going on in my group at Caltech that I'm excited about uh, and, and how it will kind of work into results and uh, in, in getting more efficient algorithms for the future of black hole imaging. Okay, so a little bit of an aside. So in the past few years, we've witnessed this really great success of, uh, in the machine learning community of deep generative models uh, in computer vision. For instance, you can, uh, given enough training images, you can actually train a, a neural network that takes an image of random noise and outputs a picture that looks like a real scene at first glance. And by plugging in different noise images, you'll get different output pictures. These deep generative models do like a very scary job at generating realistic looking images. For instance, you can log into this www.whichfacesreal.com and try to guess which image is fake and which one is a real one. And although there are some artifacts you may be able to pick up on, it's pretty amazing how realistic these images look. And so why am I telling you this? Well, these deep neural networks define an implicit distribution over the space of images. And these impressive results I showed indicate that these networks allow us to learn very flexible and expressive distributions that capture complex correlations and pixels. And so inspired by these generative networks, my postdoc Hassan has been developing an approach to sample from a posterior distribution using a learned generative neural network. Our goal is to learn the weights theta of a neural network such that if you pass a random input noise to the network, the output of the network will be an image where that image is equivalent to a sample from the image reconstruction posterior distribution. And different input noise uh, will result in different posterior sample images. Essentially, the neural network is just learning a mapping. We would like the neural network to learn a mapping from a noise distribution to the image reconstruction posterior distribution. Okay, so how would we go about training this network? Well, unlike in the case of the face generator, we don't have a training set of images to use. If we did, if we had a set of images, just like we had a set of face images, uh, then we would be done, right? Because then we would just have samples from the image reconstruction posterior, and there would be no need to learn the neural network to generate the samples of the posterior. Okay, so let's walk through what we might wanna do instead. Instead of using a collection of training images to solve for the neural network, as is typically done, let's in try, instead try to build up a loss 
function that we might want to use to optimize the weights theta of the network. So we want to find a neural network that every time we sample a new image x from this network, the posterior probability of that sample conditioned on the observed measurements y um, is high. In other words, we want to minimize the expected negative log posterior of our neural network samples. And simply rewriting this using Bayes' rule, uh, we once again can see how we can spl split that posterior into a data likelihood term and an image prior term, just like we did in our regularized maximum likelihood approach I, I talked about earlier. So overall, this is looking very similar to the regularized maximum likelihood problem. Just now we are taking an expectation over image samples rather than solving for an image. So we want to say, I'm going to sample from my network many times, and I want that expected image that comes out to have a high posterior. The, um, here, the optimization hasn't uh, written at all, uh, changed at all. We're just uh, uh, writing it in terms of those likelihood and priors. And so, you know, this optimization, maybe this makes sense, right? Uh, this solves for a network that produces images that have a high posterior likelihood, but there is a catch. And that's that this is not going to sample from the image posterior. It's just going to collapse to a single deterministic solution. It's going to try to find a network, the network weights, to always produce the exact same image that scores best under this loss. And that's not what we want because that's not capturing the uncertainty in our reconstructions we so, that we're trying to get after. So what should we do? Well, it turns out that in order to learn the distribution of all possible reconstructed images, we found through a very simple proof that we simply need to include an entropy term on the end to encourage the diversity of the generative samples from our neural network. So this is the entropy of the distribution of the neural network samples. So we add this additional term here at the end. This just trying to increase the entropy of the distribution of images that are produced by this neural network. And this prevents the network from collapsing and only just producing one single image since it wants to make sure that the neural network's image distribution has entropy. It, it, it requires that there be a diversity of solutions that come out. And so what I've said here, okay, you know, maybe there's a little bit of intuition to it, but it sounds pretty hacky. Uh, but actually, this solution ends up having solid mathematical foundation. And briefly speaking, it's just the specific variational Bayesian method. Uh, uh, and in variational methods, what it basically means is we define this simple family of density functions. For instance, uh, Q theta here, visualized by this blue space of possible distributions. Um, so th this is a family of distributions. And then we can solve an optimization problem to find the parameter state of star that best match the target posterior distribution, the one in that, that yellow star there. And then the question becomes, what should this family of distribution of vari variational distributions be? Traditionally, uh, they were pretty simple so that you can solve all the necessary integrals to efficiently evaluate probabilities and et cetera, et cetera. And so usually people stuck with simple distribution families like Gaussian distributions. But by using a very particular type of neural network called a flow-based network, we can actually define a very flexible family of distributions parameterized by theta, uh, these the, where theta here are the network weights. And this flexible family of distributions can better capture the image posterior distributions that we're interested in targeting. And so all the really the neural network do, does here is it gives us flexibility we didn't have before with the simple variational methods. And this allows us to get much closer to faithfully approximating samples from a well-defined posterior distribution. Okay, so we've, we've uh, tested this approach in multiple different cases and even in non-black hole imaging cases like medical imaging, but due to time today, I think I'm only briefly gonna show a couple examples I find instructive. So here is an example. On the top is a synthetic image of a black hole. And at the same time, uh, right next to it, it's blurred to the resolution we'd be able to expect uh, to achieve with our radio telescope. And we took this image and we generated synthetic data from it uh, as if the Event Horizon Telescope were actually seeing this distribution of flux on the sky. And using this mock data set, we ran our, typ our typical regularized maximum likelihood methods to see what we got. And we noticed that every time we ran the method with a slightly different initialization image, we would recover different results. In some images, the bright spot was in the top right. And in some cases, the bright spot was in the bottom left. 
and it appeared that both modes fit the data pretty well. Um, this actually is not that surprising because actually the, the optimization problem we're solving is a non-convex optimization problem. And so you would expect to have different local minima and maybe that would also, those local minima also correspond to different modes in your posterior. So we tested our deep probabilistic imaging algorithm on the data to learn an approximate posterior distribution. And on the bottom right are some samples from that learned neural network that we, uh, that we got after about one hour of training on a, G a single GPU. So you can see that our learned network was able to capture a posterior distribution that also indicates that there are two modes in our, in our reconstructed posterior. And so by embedding our images in 2D space, we see that most of our neural network samples cluster into two modes with their mean and variation shown to the right of each clustered mode. And the distribution of data fitting loss for each image in uh, each mode show that although it can be difficult to tell which image is correct by inspecting the statistics of a single image, they're pretty close. By analyzing the histogram of statistics for each mode, it became clearer which mode was more likely to correspond with the true image. Mode two in this case, which did happen to look more like the truth. But perhaps what is most interesting and exciting is what happens when we actually run this approach on real data. So this is the result we got when we ran the approach on real uh, M87 black hole data. And what I find really encouraging is that if you compare the standard deviation in the resulting images to the standard deviation we had published earlier, you can see that they're amazingly similar. Although these standard deviation maps represent slightly different things, one is uncertainty due to the underlying model optimization and optimization procedure, and the other is uncertainty due to the data, they are still very, uh, are comparable. And in both uncertainty maps, there are these three kind of regions with the highest uncertainty that seem to match up. And so to me, this was incredibly exciting because when I saw this result, uh, this was actually the very first time uh, Ha ran the method, his method on the real M87 data, and he got the same, nearly the same result that it took a whole group months to achieve. And so I'm really excited to be making progress on methods that will allow us to better understand results in the future more efficiently. But now let's get back to uh, M87. So from many different angles, we've recovered this image of the light circling a black hole. And this image tells us so much about the immediate environment around a black hole. But perhaps the most amazing thing is that by comparing this picture to simulations scientists have made for years, we find that the image we've taken is amazingly consistent with a number of these predictions. And at the end of the day, really the biggest thing we recovered is we got a ring and something that may seem so obvious now, but that was really an ultimate question. Would we see a ring? You might notice though that the simulation I just showed you was moving. So is our recovered image of M87 also moving? And in fact, it turns out that it actually is. So another interesting thing is that it, uh, we observed the M87 black hole over four nights over the course of a week, two days closer to the beginning of the week and two days closer to the end. And if we independently recovered each of these images, we, we independently imaged each of them with the same um, parameter settings. And then we strung those images together into a very short movie. And so we can play those in that movie and you can see some variation, some, some evolution. So I'm gonna play it for you right here. It's really hard to see. So I'm gonna play it again. You might notice that the bright spot is originally more on the left hand side and then it kind of it becomes more on the bottom. I'll play it again. So we don't know exactly what this evolution is caused by, whether it's material rotating or just filaments getting brighter and dimmer. But what we are sure of is that the black hole is evolving. And that's because it appears in the raw measurements we take with very high uh, statistical significance. And actually getting a hold of a black hole's time variability is quite important for a number of reasons. It will not only give us a window into the dynamics around a black hole, and hopefully an understanding of how these powerful galactic scale jets are forming, but it also helps us in, in mapping the space time of a black hole and in constraining our prediction of general relativity uh, uh, in the future. But actually the black hole in M87 is not the only black hole we're interested in imaging to get a handle on the question of time variability. In the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy, 26,000 light years away from us, uh, there's a cluster of stars. And by peering past all the galactic dust with infrared telescopes, 
Astronomers have mapped the, the paths of these cluster of stars over decades. And by tracking the motions of the stars over time, astronomers have concluded that the only thing small and dense enough to cause this motion is actually a supermassive black hole. In fact, this discovery led to the Nobel Prize in Physics just this, no, uh, this past October uh, um, for the work of Andrea Ghez uh, and Reinhard Genzel for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy, otherwise known as Sagittarius A star. And so as awesome as M87 is, Sagittarius A star, or uh, like we call Sag A star for short, might be able to help us better understand some of these questions. So Sag A star is teeny tiny compared to M87. M87 is six and a half billion solar masses, uh, whereas uh, Sag A star is a measly four million solar masses. But because it's so much closer to us, uh, it appears about the same size in the sky. But since it is so small, that means that the gas can orbit around it much more quickly. So whereas it takes four to 30 days for gas to make a complete orbit around M87, for Sag A star, gas can make a full orbit every four to 30 minutes. And so we would like to be able to image the time variations around Sag A star. And to do that, we've been developing methods to try to recover not just the static image from the data, but actually movies. But if you thought recovering a static image was a hard l pose problem, this is orders of magnitude more challenging because we have the same amount of data, but now we have to solve for the pixels in a full movie rather than just a single frame. And so as important as it is to continue pushing on the algorithmic approaches to squeeze more out of the data we've already collected, it's also important to realize that to extract more science, we also have to think about improving not just our algorithms that analyze data, but also the instrument that collects the data to begin with. And so to help us take a better picture, we're trying to design a next generation array which expands our telescope of ne uh, our network of telescopes from six, six different locations on Earth. And so we've already begun building out our array to get more data, adding telescopes in uh, Greenland, France, one in Arizona with the help of Dan Moroni and his students uh, in, uh, in Arizona's astronomy department. And the one I'm most excited about myself is we uh, recently got NSF funding to add a telescope at Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observatory. But imagine what we could do if we added 10 more. Well, maybe we could actually make a video of the gas falling into the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And as I said, being able to do this would be a huge scientific gold mine. But before we just plop down a bunch of telescopes, we need to be very careful. And that's because building a new telescope is expensive, at least millions, but usually tens of millions of dollars. And so we really need to try to optimize to find the, the locations that give us the biggest bang for our buck. And so that leads to the last part of my talk today, on using machine learning for optimized telescope design. So how should we go about solving for the locations of telescopes in the next generation array? Well, typically the design of the sensors are idealized and considered independently from the image reconstruction problem. And in doing so, many assumptions are made. For instance, ignoring nonlinearities in the system, complexities in the noise, However, especially for parameter for problems where the data is so correlated and the noise is so challenging, it's a huge missed opportunity to not consider them together. And so because these problems are so intimately related, we really should be able to optimizing the sensor, sensor design and reconstruction method jointly. And so how should we go about solving for this? Well, if you rearrange the blocks in this diagram, you'll notice that it looks very similar to something called an autoencoder where the sensing system is the encoder that produces the measurements or codes, and the image, uh, imaging algorithm is the decoder. Deep autoencoders, where the encoder and decoder are neural networks, are often used for image compression, where you're solving for the weights of a neural network that encode a picture in a small number of measurements at the same time as a network that then decodes those measurements into an image. In the reconstruction problem, you could use an arbitrary mathematical function that takes you from the measurements to an image for the reconstruction. So we could use a neural network for the decoder. It just needs to be something that we can code up in a, in a computer. But unlike a deep encoder, uh, sensing systems that we build must obey physical constraints. And so we can't use some arbitrary neural network for the encoder because we need to make sure that it's something that we can build. We can't just build a mathematical function with our telescopes, a random one. And so ha has also, Hassan has also been leading this effort in my group at Caltech. And the approach that we propose is to develop a physically constrained encoder 
that we train with the decoder end to end. So let's zoom in to see how we do that. So from an initial input image, Z here, we can define a forward model of the measurements we expect to collect. These are like simulated measurements. And in this example, we pretend we have three possible telescopes to sample, color-coded blue, red, and green. And the measurements are, that are indicated from these telescopes are indicated by the colored dots. And these measurements can be complicated, nonlinear, correlated, noisy, what, what have you. It doesn't have to be differentiable or anything like that. And here we show all possible samples. And so we could pass all the possible samples off uh, as our collected measurements to the decoder that then does the image reconstruction to make an image. But in that case, we would actually have to build all of these telescopes. And our goal is to, uh, is to choose among them to find which are the best to build. And to do that, we introduce uh, what we call a sensor sampling distribution that characterizes the probability that we sample from a particular telescope. And we sample telescopes from this distribution and mask out any kind of measurements that were not produced by those telescopes. So now we just have the red and blue dots remaining. And every time we sample from this probability distribution, we sample different combinations of telescopes and obtain different observed measurements. And then once we sample this, this they are then passed on to those, the decoder, which acts as the image reconstruction method to recover an image. So we can string all the pieces together here into a single differentiable network, a single differentiable function with trainable blocks highlighted here in red. And our ultimate goal is to use this network to learn an optimal probability distribution over the telescopes to build. And we do that by maximizing the similarity between the input and output images, um, encouraging sensor sparsity to reduce the number of telescopes to build, and um, a term that encourages sampling diversity to make sure we've explored the full space of possible telescope designs. And then we learn the sensor sampling distribution parameters during end-to-end -end training uh, using um, just machine learning, regular kind of machine learning libraries. And so what, what is the sensor sampling distribution that we search for? Well, in this particular work, we modeled our sensor sampling distribution as a binary fully connected IC model. It could be, uh, it can kind of be an arbitrary differentiable uh, a model, but in this one, we uh, had a fully connected IC model. And if you don't know what that is, no problem. Basically, it's just a joint distribution over on and off states for the different telescopes. Um, and it's parameterized by two kinds of parameters. One that we call the site activity, which is basically just how important it is to turn on one telescope site, irrespective of all the others. And the other we call site correlation, which indicate if a particular telescope is turned on, if it's better uh, uh, to turn another telescope on or off. And why would we ever want to turn a telescope off? Well, to save resources. We want to be able to find the smallest set of telescopes that perform well. And then we search for these parameters theta during end-to-end -end training. So here is an example of a telescope distribution we've learned. The IC model parameters theta JJ on the left quantify the activity or importance of a single telescope. And the model parameters theta JK on the right quantify the correlation between pairs of telescopes, where red represents positive correlations and blue represents negative correlations. And from the recovered distributions, we can see some patterns we expect to see. For instance, in the case of uncorrelated noise, in many cases, co-located telescopes are heavily penalized from sampling together. And that makes sense because in, in independent uh, noise, uh, you're just taking the same measurement in that case. So it's just repetitive measurements. But my favorite thing is that just not the things we expect to see, but the things we don't know what to expect. So for instance, by changing the types of noise we train with, we can see how this affects our results. For instance, this is a result with purely Gaussian thermal noise included on the, uh, for, in the forward model. And when we add the difficult atmospheric phase air that plagues our measurements, scrambles our measurements I talked about before, the array preferences to actually change fairly drastically. And so notice that when I flip back and forth, the correlations have changed. And we find that this tells us about structures in the geometry that are preferred in the case of this challenging data correlations. And complicated and correlated noise is not something that people can easily consider analytically. And so I'm really excited to be able to handle these much more complicated models of noise uh, and, 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 uh, and sensor, sensing functions and try to learn from them. So using this approach, we're starting to understand where we may want to be placing our next ground-based telescope to reveal uh, more of the unseen. 
And I'm also excited that we soon may be uh, applying it to a variety of other scenarios, including even the optimal placement of telescopes in space. And so hopefully by jointly improving our sensing system and reconstruction methods, optimizing them simultaneously, we may be able to soon see even more. And so to close, it's clear we've learned a lot from this image of the black hole in M87 already. But what I hope I also got across today is that we're really just at the beginning. And now that we have this new extreme laboratory of gravity, we're thinking towards the future and ways that we can improve our instrument and algorithms, improve them jointly with the ideas from uh, machine learning to learn even more. And so hopefully one day uh, we'll be able to show you uh, not just a static image of a black hole, uh, but a movie of a black hole as the gas is slowly falling towards uh, the event horizon. And so with that, I want to thank the amazing team of collaborators I had the opportunity to work with on a daily basis. So many uh, people contributed to the work I talked about today. Uh, in addition to her who has led the machine learning developments I talked about today, I want to especially thank all the early career collaborators who are often behind the scenes, uh, but who have done hard work to make the project a success. And here I'm showing those that were recognized with early career and PhD thesis awards for the first M87 results, including Junhan Kim, who recently graduated uh, from University of Arizona with his PhD uh, and working together across different kinds of continents on different aspects of the project, spanning instrumentation to theory, uh, really made the first images a success and will be the key in developing the next generation of this telescope uh, in the future. And so with that, thank you. I look forward to answering any questions. Thanks, Katie, for that fantastic talk. Do we have any questions? Who wants to go first? Um, yeah, hi, Katie. This is Michael Hart. Um, if I could hi. jump in. Um, I, uh, can, maybe I missed, uh, let me turn my video on. You can, hi. Uh, hi. Um, I guess the thing that troubles me about sort of searching for optimized um, arrangements of, of the array is that aren't you sort of playing favorites in UV space, sort of penalizing a priori certain Fourier components over others, and that sort of automatically biases what kind of images you're sensitive to? Yeah, so you're always going to, it's a great, great question. So you're always going to be, have bias. Like I said at the beginning, we can never get away from it. And so, um, when we're training those networks, um, basically what is imposing that bias is the kinds of images that we train with. So what um, the results that I showed in, uh, in these slides, although you can train with lots of different kinds of images and see how that affects the results, we trained with um, actually images of, of clothing. So it wasn't black holes. We wanted to do something totally different <laughs> than black holes because we, we wanted to test on black hole images and we didn't want to include that pri at too much of the prior. So we had pictures of shoes and pants and shirts and stuff that we trained the, the method with. So it hopefully wouldn't be uh, trying to, it wouldn't be encoding like black hole features. Of course, you could train it with just black hole images. Actually, I didn't um, include this, but we also did it. You could just trade out that final network uh, and you can, um, for instance, with a classification network, it doesn't have to be an image reconstruction. It could be uh, an image feature extraction or, or what is the mass of this black hole or is this black hole from model A or model B? And so in those kinds of situations, you could train with black hole simulations, but then you're in, you're, you have to, you know, underline that, you know, you're assuming this huge thing of this model of images that you're use, using for training. So I think it's important to try to train with different kinds of images and see how those biases change. One thing is, okay, even though we trained with images of clothing and, and stuff like that, there are still some things here that we're assuming that you might be concerned with. One is that we can, um, restricted the field of view. So we all, all those images have the same field of view. So we have some results in the paper that show as you change the field of view, how the array preferences change. Um, as you change the flux of the image, how those array preferences change, as you change the noise. So these are all things that are important to explore. The, I think that the main thing I'm trying to get across is these things are hard to do analytically, right? And, and, um, and the machine learning allows us to easily plug in different things and kind of explore in the space of, even when you have non-differentiable uh, forward models and noise and, and complicated situations like that. Thank you. Yeah, so I look forward to seeing a picture of a cosmic shoe above the fold of the New York Times. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a surprise? Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? I have a question. 
Hi, uh, was it hard to control for uh, different types of noise when taking the image? So let's say was shot noise a big factor in having to control for it or just how did you go about controlling for noise? You're talking about the noise in the original data that we have. Yeah. Yeah, so we're not dealing with things like shot noise because uh, we're in the radio, in the radio there's, uh, that's not as uh, big of a problem, but um, uh, we're not taking images also. Let me, I'll just also be clear. The, the information that we get are data streams. So we're basically, at every telescope, we're just getting a stream of data. It's not an image. And the, how we get the image is by, we do something, uh, the cross, uh, time average cross correlation, and that gives us frequency components and stuff. But in the radio, we have other kinds of uh, air that we have to deal with. Um, as I talked about, the biggest one really is um, because of the atmosphere. Uh, because we're at short radio wavelengths, uh, the atmosphere changes on very quick time scales and the phase uh, of our signal and that the water vapor affects kind of this, the propagation delay and this causes this huge amount of noise. So that's really the main thing that we had that we had to deal with that scrambled our measurements. But there's also lots of other kinds of noise. Um, there, we also take information of the polarization of the light. And so when we are, uh, there's um, calibration errors with that. Uh, there's leakage across the different polarization channels um, that we have, have to solve for. Uh, there's, uh, Lot, there's non-closing errors because of the calibration that is done ahead of time. So there's many like different kinds of errors, but I would say like the really the primary one that is the huge challenge that makes our problem so non-convex and challenging to optimize is the atmosphere and and, and, the, and the phase offsets. Thank you. So I have a question in the chat. It says from Arturo Chavez person, has the network of telescopes been calibrated against known and independently measured celestial objects, does this help to calibrate the telescope for black hole imaging? Yeah, great question. Um, so, uh, okay, there's two kinds of calibration. So one is in the traditional kinds of radio uh, uh, imaging, uh, radio astronomy stuff when, with longer wavelengths. Usually you'll calibrate by looking at a known source uh, that you know is, for instance, a point source. And then you can say, okay, um, I, my atmosphere is making me is making my data crazy, but I know this is a point source, so I know what it should look like. And so then you can calibrate out your phase errors and transfer those onto the other data. So a lot of times you'll have your telescopes, you'll look at the unknown source, then look at the known source, look at unknown and known, and go back and forth to calibrate your data. Uh, the problem is, uh, well, there's two problems in this. One is the fact that the uh, the atmosphere at one millimeter is changing too rapidly. So we, uh, it's changing on the order of seconds. So there's not time to go back and forth. And so we can't transfer a solution. And that's why we have to solve for calibration simultaneously with imaging. Um, and the second one is that uh, there really are no point sources at that resolution that, uh, that we can look at or not ones that were very close to the source that I, I at least I, I, I don't know. Um, and so you really everything that looks like a point source to other telescopes uh, is resolved for us. Uh, um, so, um, and the problem is that we don't have other telescopes that have looked at these sources at that resolution and with those wavelengths. So there, so you could also say, okay, why don't I just look at that source and validate that I'm getting the exact same image with the Event Horizon Telescope as I've gotten with another uh, telescope. Well, there is no other telescope that observes with that resolution and that frequency. So you can't do that either. But what we did do is we observe other caliber, other sources other active galactic nuclei. And then we, um, we image them using the same imaging procedures that I talked about. And from that, we derive what our calibration would be. So uh, when I talked about the atmosphere uh, scrambling up our measurements, it scrambles the phase of our measurements a lot worse than the amplitude. And so what that means is the amplitude phases are, are, are changing slow, much slower over time. So although we can't transfer phase solutions, we can look at the amplitude solutions that we recover for the different sources, and we can try to see do they match up across different images that we recover. And so we imaged, for instance, if you look at the M87 paper, we imaged a source called 3C279, uh, which is like a black hole, but it's a black hole we can't see the event horizon uh, structure of, and there's this jet coming off of it. And so we imaged that uh, and we looked at the calibration parameters and you can see in the paper that they uh, roughly match up. 
another thing is, although we're not able to image that source at the one millimeter wavelength at the resolution, we thought we um, observe it at other wavelengths, for instance, at three millimeters or, um, or um, and, and we can see the direction of the jet. So we saw that our event horizon telescope images were roughly oriented in the same direction. And so although we don't know what it exactly should look like, it's roughly kind of aligned with what we would expect from past observations at different wavelengths. Kind of like comparing your green channel of an image to the red channel of an image. Thanks. So do we have other questions? Oh, yes. Um, hi, uh, my name is Kevin. I'm also here in Pasadena. Um, Actually, very cool that you're treating the telescopes like other layers in the neural network. Um, I was curious, in lieu of nonlinear activation functions, how are you guys parameterizing the nonlinear half of your network? Uh, oh, sorry, say it again. So in, in terms of the what? Say it again. Uh, yeah. uh, how are you representing your nonlinear layers, uh, nonlinear activation functions optically um, in your autoencoder network? How are we, you're saying for the encoder part, the physically, mo the, the first part that I talked about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in that part, it's all completely like, it's just a, okay, there are nonlinear layers, but it's not like how people put together regular neural networks. So it's right. not like convolution, nonlinearity, convolution, nonlinearity or something. It's all kind of uh, physically motivated. Basically, we have a probability distribution. You sample from that probability distribution. We do that through a Gibbs sampling style network. So it's all kind of, we, we just write out Gibbs sampling in a differentiable way. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and then that's just plugged in. The decoder has is really that part that's like the convolution, nonlinearity, convolution, nonlinearity. So the mm -hmm. first part has some nonlinearities because we actually have we're not exactly doing Gibbs sampling. We have to approximate the Gibbs sampling, but mm -hmm. it's really like completely like derived from the math of sampling from a probability distribution. It's not uh, just. It's not. It's the only weights in that are the weights of the probability distribution. It's not of the weights of sampling from that probability distribution. If if that's clear, Did, is that a little more clear? I can go back. To yeah, that. actually, it, the I have a follow up from what you just said because I, I understood what you what you said. Um, I guess how do you deal with then uh, represent when you're doing the back propagation, um, vanishing gradients or and. Uh, causing internal bias in the system like how do you know that the, f the fidelity of the image the final image is true to the original object you're observing yeah, uh so uh let me think so the yeah vanishing gradients is always kind of a problem i think uh i i have to go back to remember exactly uh what hud did uh to deal with that i think he used some at least but i think it was more of a problem in the second half of the network uh, mm -hmm. the decoder part, which is taking the measurements and making an image. I think you had to do some batch norm and stuff to kind of keep gradients uh, go, going well. But I think really the first part, uh, I think the main challenge was because in Gibbs sampling, you are supposed to be sampling infinite times, right? And we had a, we have a discrete number of times that we're sampling. And so I think to do that, well, we did some tricks, for instance, every uh, every sampling, it really shouldn't matter if you're doing it an infinite number of times, the order in which you sample, but right. to make it uh, better for the fixed number of sampling iterations, we we scramble the measurements every time and things like this that allow us to get a better result with a fixed number of samples. But I don't remember having to deal with vanishing gradients on the encoder side, uh, just only on the decoder side, which are just using traditional, I mean, uh, like, uh, not traditional, like, standard techniques that people use. It was just a unit structure, basically. Mm, cool. Uh, it wasn't just a unit. The, the, uh, when we were using the phase calibration data, it was a, a little bit more physically motivated, but it was kind of physical motivated layer with a unit layer. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I guess, what kind of different telescope optical technologies did you try to represent the encoding layer? Um, like, what is the space of parameters we searched over? Oh, no, like, physically, like, was it a deformable, I guess, like, a, what kind of optical system where it was in the telescopes, uh, tech, like, physically, to I represent? 
tell me if I'm not answering your question, but um, here we were only, we, we're only using radio telescopes. Um, oh, I see. And so, um, yeah, they're all have to be at the same uh, receiver at the same wavelengths and stuff. And at this point, we were only optimizing in that paper, only optimizing the location of the telescope, actually not even the location. We were choosing among like 50 telescopes, what were the best five to sample from. So it wasn't even optimizing uh, the location. It's, uh, it's a sensor sampling, like which one selection, sorry, sensor selection problem. There was selecting out of these telescopes, which ones would be the best places to put a telescope because there are, we have like proposed locations on tops of mountains and stuff that we care about uh, rather than just putting them in the ocean. Uh, so uh, anyway, so yeah, it was more of a, but as far as the parameters of like the telescope dish size and stuff like that, that wasn't being optimized. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Brandon, did you have a question? How did you know? Um, <laughs> Your video is on. Yeah. Uh, so very nice talk, Katie. This was uh, uh, really well explained, I think. Um, I have a question that's actually not related to the computational aspects, but I was curious for the Event Horizon Telescope, what drove the choice to 1.3 millimeter and what uh, limitations, if any, um, are there to going to shorter wavelengths? Yeah. Within, still within the millimeter band, of course. Yeah, let me show you a video actually done by CK Chan, who um, is at Arizona. So, um, so when you are at two short uh, at optical wavelengths, there's like a bunch of dust that you can't pierce through to the center uh, and see that kind of ring of light. And at two long of wavelengths, uh, for instance, this is a simulation done by CK uh, at about a three millimeter wavelength. And at these three millimeter wavelengths, um, uh, the, the gas around the black hole is optically thick and you can't see that, that ring of light we're kind of targeting. And so as you go down from a three millimeter wavelength towards a 1.1 1 .1 millimeter wavelength, that gas becomes more optically thin. It peels away until eventually you kind of see that ring of light here at, that we're kind of going after. And so um, th that's one direction. You can go lower than uh, one millimeter. Uh, there's a, but there's a few challenges. Uh, well, one is that, uh, one is that we, one millimeter is already kind of pushing it in terms of what we can observe from here on earth because of the atmosphere absorbing us. So there's, you know, absorption uh, by the atmosphere. And so we are pushing towards uh, 345. So one millimeter is about 230 gigahertz uh, in frequency. And we're pushing to 345 uh, in the future. Um, but there are, less locations on earth that you can observe at this and it's much more challenging to observe at that higher wavelength you could go to space uh to observe at a higher uh wavelength but then it's co very costly which is something we're looking at not just for observing at higher frequency but also uh other black holes at higher resolution and uh and uh being able to do a number of other things but um but one kind of thing that like is very nice about the ht is that as far as science projects go or the large physics projects is pretty cheap <laughs> in comparison because of the fact that we kind of leveraged other telescopes that were originally built for other purposes and just like kind of stole them and put our own stuff in there. And so it made it very cheap. Whereas if we went to space, this is very expensive. It, you know, I think like, I don't really trust this number that much, but people quote like under hundred million dollars for the EHT results. Um, but um, going to space, like I talk to people at JPL now a lot and they're usually quoting me half a billion to a billion dollars for a single telescope. And so it, it, it's a, you know, I think that it's a, it's something that we're interested in, but you have to show the science case really strongly and it's pretty far out. So I think that there is a, uh, in the next, you know, 10 years or so, maybe even, okay, even less than that. Uh, I mean, we are pushing to other uh, higher wavelengths, but they have trade-offs. So, yeah. So, so what I'm gathering is it's, it's primarily atmosphere and less so on the electronics and Oh, no, okay, end. that's another thing. Yeah, okay. as you get to terahertz, it's really hard to build these receivers. Right, okay. so that's why it's also taking, well, there's one is that the atmosphere, it's less places to example, but these are things that people are actually developing. Like at Arizona, this is like, a, this is research, right? To de develop these receivers and install them in the telescope. So uh, yeah, this is a, something that requires on the instrumentation side, a lot of work. Uh, Greg, did you have a question? I do, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Katie, for the talk. That was really cool. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation that um, because of the the extreme mass of the black hole, um, that light will not necessarily take a straight path um, if passing close to the vicinity of the black hole. Um, and I was wondering if there are any um, considerations that need to be taken um, for objects in between us, our observation point and M87 that would, like, cause I could imagine like, okay, so there's something happening at the, um, the black hole horizon over here and then there's our observer and my intuition would be like, okay, there's just a straight line between those two. But are there any other, you know, um, fluctuations in, I guess, space time in between us and M87 that need to be taken into consideration to say, okay, this is light that went from the event horizon to where we're observing. You know, so we're really, um, well, we don't have to worry about other kinds of stars or other things like that because they, it's kind of like um, the way I kind of think about it is if you're like, looking at a, a cloudy sky or something like that and there's a bird high frequency looking over it you kind of really focused on that bird and you you lose out on the low frequency information and so it's kind of like even the m87 image that we have uh, we as i said at the beginning there's this huge galactic scale jet that's coming off of it we know it's there but actually we don't even see it in our images because of the fact that we don't sample uh, low frequencies enough right now, which is something we're trying to improve in the future, but we're invisible to things that we even know are there because we're very sensitive to this particular frequency range of, of the structure. That being said, there are things, so M87, it's not a, a problem, but for the black hole in the center of our uh, Milky Way, the Sag star black hole, uh, between us and the black hole, there's this interstellar medium uh, that actually scatters, uh, that, that uh, scatters our light. And so um, it's kind of like looking at the black hole through a frosted window, uh, where that frosted window is even changing over time. And so it, it causes uh, diffractive scattering, which kind of blurs the image, and um, refractive scattering, which kind of makes it look like, you know, like you're looking at something under a pool of water. Uh, and so this is something that we do have to consider for the Sagittarius A star black hole. So that one's challenging for a number of reasons, not just the time variability, but also the scattering and stuff like that. Cool, thank you. So do we have other questions? Can, can I ask a really dumb, basic VLBI yeah, question? Of course, yeah, go. Uh, and it's not dumb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, do you, how do you establish the actual geometry of your array? I mean, can you use closure phases or something like that to figure out where your antennae really are with respect to each other? Oh, OK. So yeah, this is something that we have to search over, basically, um, because um, so actually, you know, uh, this idea of very long baseline interferometry is actually used even to measure like plate tectonics and stuff, the motion of it. So it's, it's so sensitive um, it, when used in the inverse direction, when you're looking at something, you know what it looks like a star or something where you know it's a point, so or not a star, some, some object that you know it's a point source. Uh, they use it to actually identify the distance between plates to, you know, submillimeter. Uh, uh, precision. So what we do instead is we know roughly where the telescopes are. Um, and based upon that, so we have these data streams, we know roughly where they are, so we can correlate, we can roughly align the signals in time and in space to get the correlation, but those are not going to be perfectly correct. And so what we do, that's that whole like, uh, where, where I talk about it, this whole, you know, calibration correlation thing, which I totally skimmed over. Um, so first you're doing this, uh, correlation. This correlation step is assuming you kind of know where the telescopes are. And this calibration step basically searches in a window to find a more precise alignment. So in the end, you have a sub picosecond uh, alignment in time uh, between the signals. And so that actually requires a computational step to do that alignment. Um, it, it, yeah. Does that help answer the question you had? Uh, yes, thank you. Right. <laughs> so if you're, if you're timing to a picosecond, I mean, sort of light travels a foot in a nanosecond. So you're looking at a thousandth of a foot. Is that kind of the precision you get? Yeah, I think it's the, uh, they, in, they, it's, it's sub picosecond. So I don't remember the conversion. Yeah. I need to think about it. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, very, very precise because we're looking at millimeter wavelengths, right? right. So, so we have to be very precise or we just lose all our signal. You got to measure to a fraction of a wavelength, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, do we have other questions? Um, I have a uh, question. Oh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, hi, I'm Joe Cox. Um, I'm interested in um, knowing, um, so, so, you know, you have all these telescopes, but you have limited, you know, telescope time, you know, and you only have so much time, you can only look at certain um, galaxies. So you kind of have to select, you know, which galaxy is going to produce the best image or in some way going to give the best results. Yeah. Um, and you kind of implied that a bit in your presentation. So I'm curious, you know, what are some of the factors that go into that selection process as in, you know, why did you pick M87 and, you know, are there other um, candidates that are just as feasible as that? Yeah, great question. Uh, and so the thing is that we only know of two black holes that are big enough on the sky to be able to see that event horizon scale structure. And those two black holes are M87 and Sagittarius A star. They appear about the same size because M87 is orders of magnitude larger, but it's much farther away from us. So uh, when you cancel out the distance uh, and size, they come out to about the same size. All other black holes that we know of right now has, have a mass or distance that, is, uh, that results in a black hole shadow that is smaller than we can see uh, with the Earth-sized telescope. So in order to see those other black holes, the event horizon scale structure, that ring structure that we expected, um, you would need a telescope that has a baseline larger than the size of the Earth. Um, we still, as I mentioned, this 3C279, these other active galactic nuclei that we image, we do look point our telescope, the event horizon telescope at them, uh, but we're not gonna see the event horizon scale structure that gives that ring. We see things like the jets coming off and stuff which are also very, which are also very exciting to, to study. Um, but it's not, yeah, those, so it's basically, that's all that we kind of have to work with. Um, you also mentioned uh, the observing time. And I think uh, I just mentioned that, yeah, that's true. Uh, we only, we actually have to propose for our telescope time every year. So we only um, usually get, you know, one, uh, one week to observe, actually five days usually to observe out of a 10 day window. Um, we have to propose for that time and it usually happens around uh, end of April or end of March, beginning of April because that ends up being the best time of year where the, uh, for the weather at all the different stations. So, you know, you, we have to consider the fact that there's weather at these stations and they all have to observe the same day. And if the weather drops out, if the weather is bad, you lose a huge amount of data um, and because, uh, dropping one telescope, you actually lose 40% of your data. Um, and so um, because of the way that calibration is done. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we, it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's also we have to do, we work, some people work on the prediction of weather and stuff of what day should we observe? Uh, because this is a big challenge as well. We can't just observe whenever we want. <laughs> Hey, thank you very much for those answers. Um, I have a quick follow-up question. Um, so, you know, at, at University of Arizona, we like to develop, you know, optical systems and improve optical capabilities. So, um, you know, is there any sort of, you know, technology that work, we're working on here? Or, you know, what kind of enabling technologies would allow us to view those other galaxies out there? Is that, that kind of technology that's being worked yeah, on now? Yeah, so an optical... Um... So optical interfer radio, uh, I'm sorry, not optical radio, optical interferometric imaging for astronomical sources is also a thing. Uh, uh, and also deals with a lot of the same problems that I talked about in terms of not having the phase information and stuff like that. A lot of the uh, ideas actually that we have for imaging kind of uh, are, many are inspired from the optical interferometry community. Um, but optical, in optical interferometry, so in, in radio interferometry, we can record our data on these hard drives. So here I'm showing all these hard drives that we've collected data of, and then we bring them together. Uh, whereas in optical interferometry, it can't be done. Uh, you can't record the data. It has to be done all, uh, you know, like in an analog with optical fibers and stuff like this. Uh, and so your telescopes are not as far apart. Uh, you know, if, if you, you can, you can't put them at far distances. Of course, observing with optical wavelengths, uh, you always have this diffraction lambda over d. So as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, you get higher and higher resolution. So it's great to observe. It would be great to you know build uh, optical systems that would allow to help us uh, at least simultaneously observe with the uh, event horizon telescope. So one. Uh, example of this is the gravity telescope uh, that is uh, that Reinhard Genzel, who was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, this past year, is involved in for uh, where he studies Sagittarius A star and kind of uh, him, him in, in a large group of people study this and, and look at kind of like hot spots that uh, or, or like structures that are around the black hole, or whether they're hot spots or not, I, I don't know. But um, 
but so here they're using uh, uh, information in the infrared. Uh, so it's much using kind of optical uh, kind of systems and um, it, optical interferometry kind of systems. Uh, and those we would love to be able to image simultaneously, uh, to observe simultaneously with those kind of systems because they give complementary information. So pushing those kind of systems uh, is also huge and would be incredibly helpful. So I, 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 you should look into the optical interferometry and in particular, the gravity collaboration. I think you might find exciting. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. That's all I have. Thanks, do we have uh, other questions? Uh, from a, a computational perspective, this is very exciting. Uh, for, and I, I guess I wanted to ask, follow up further from what you told me. Uh, when you guys represented the nonlinear activation functions in the probabilistic model, did you try other representations to see if you would uh, reach, you know, convergence sooner, or or opt get higher, more accurate results? So uh, maybe this. So maybe I, I'll interpret what I think you're saying. You tell me if this is right now what you're asking. But so I talked about how we use this icing model, which is a fairly simple. Um, probability model that will allow us to model on and off states. It's a binary Markov random field, basically. Um, but it, that only can handle um, uh, second order correlations. It only models up to second order correlations. So we were thinking, well, you know, maybe there are actually other kinds of uh, higher order correlations that are important in the design of the telescope. And so we also um, have done some work on um, replacing that um, icing model uh, probability distribution of the telescope locations with a what is called a normalized flow or flow based network. Um, and uh, just like how I, the same kind of network that I talked about in for the efficient posterior exploration. And, uh, and this allows us to model more complicated uh, distributions of telescope designs. We found that it actually thus far, it hasn't made a, a big difference in terms of the designs of the telescopes that we are looking at. However, for other computational imaging problems, it did make a difference. So for instance, we apply the same technique to Fourier tachography microscopy. And in that case, uh, the second order correlations were not enough to identify the optimal, the best um, uh, light patterns that we apply to the microscopic samples. And so using the a uh, flow-based network that gave us much more complicated sampling distributions uh, mm -hmm. allowed us to get much uh, better results um, in our sensor design. Um, so yeah, these flow-based networks, I think they're pretty cool. Uh, th what is a flow-based network? It's basically a neural network that's invertible. And so because it's invertible, that allows you to evaluate probabilities of the, which you can't do with tradition, with most neural networks. Most neural networks are not invertible. And so you're constrained by the invertibility uh, but they still can do very well and get these like very complicated distributions still and they're invertible. So I really like the fact that they're probabilistic in nature. Cool. Did, did you guys publish on that too? Um, or uh, soon, soon to be published? We pub the, so the stuff that I talked about in this presentation uh, was published. So we talked about the flow network and the efficient posterior exploration you can see on my website. Uh, the paper on using the, the uh, flow-based network to do the microscopy, we're just being slow to get out. But it's, it's basically the same method as before, just replace the icing model with the flow-based network. Cool. Can't wait to read it. Do we have other questions? Okay, if not, I'll just switch to the meet and greet, which is basically, you know, just uh, for students mainly to introduce themselves to Katie, ask maybe a question that's not necessarily technically related to her talk. Um, so do we have any anyone who wants to, you know, take this unique opportunity to, to ask Katie any questions? Um, if not, I'll start. I have a question so oh. far, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I have a question I, you know, I asked one earlier, but I I'm just curious um, about your career, you know, how, how did you end up, um, you know, working for gravitational waves and, you know, you, or sorry, um, black hole imaging and, um, and you've kind of become the, the face of this technology, um, you know, how did you manage to um, become that? <laughs> uh, I guess accident, but um, the, yeah, so um, I come from a, I do not come from any kind of astrophysics background at all. So I, I come from a, I did my PhD in a computer vision group. 
um, where I, I really enjoyed uh, working on more low level computer vision problems. Um, and, you know, I, I, I did my PhD, I mean, I did my undergrad in electrical engineering. So I always kind of like had a love for like signal processing and more low level kind of, of problems like this. And when I was in the computer vision group, I found myself gravitating to more low level computer vision problems, inverse problems, things like this, uh, computational photography kinds of things. And uh, a couple years in, I, I just kind of stumbled along across the project. My advisor told me he was meeting with, uh, at the time there was no collabor official collaboration actually. Um, so we were, he was meeting with um, uh, Shep Dolman who ended up being the director of the collaboration. Um, and uh, and uh, he, uh, and we, he was just giving a presentation. They were just presenting on the work and my advisor was presenting on some work from our group. And I just like, I remember being in that meeting and like not understanding basically anything that they were saying, except like, you know, there's like black holes, which I had heard of and like measurements before you, before you transform, of course I knew and, and things like that. But I remember like leaving the meeting, just being like, you know, I totally want to work on this problem because it's so, so cool. And it brings together ideas that I, that I feel familiar that I'm that I enjoy in inverse problems and images and understanding images and the questions around that and and also like what's cooler than working on black holes and and so I, I just started you know kind of working on that but uh, at first I was working fairly independently which was a huge mistake because uh, like although you could like code up some you know random <laughs> algorithm you, you never are understanding all the details of you know how complicated the measurements are and noise and all this kind of stuff so it really started taking off once I uh, met with um, I met these new postdocs and and students who started joining the collaboration and who who started at um, Harvard uh, Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and so I would go I was in MIT in Boston as well and and so I would go and uh, <laughs> and work with them once or twice a week and that you know sl slowly I they they taught me like everything I know about <laughs> astrophysics or you know radio astronomy and stuff and and so you know I, I think it was a amazing uh, uh like I really love that um you know I taught them about computational imaging and computer vision and machine learning and they taught me about astrophysics and all this other you know other kind of stuff and black holes and everything and so I think we had a lot of fun and we learned from each other and I think we did so much better work than if we had uh, it worked, you know, independently. It just wouldn't have been possible, to be honest. And um, yeah, and then, so, you know, this is, I feel like it, a, a real example of where um, interdisciplinary collaboration was, I think, really essential for this. This project brought together many different kinds of uh, disciplines that were essential to making a success. Um, and then as far as like, you know, the, the second half, like, oh, what, you know, how am I, so, uh, so <laughs> affiliated with it. Like, I think, you know, it's just people like to grab onto certain faces and stuff. And there are many people who have uh, made huge contributions to the project who maybe are not, you know, as known in the news and all this kind of stuff. And I just, I, I really hope that the message gets out and want to emphasize over and over again that this is like not possible without tons of people and, and lots of contributions from a lot early career people who, uh, you know, whose names are not always known. So I think it's uh, it's important as we go towards these big scientific collaborations where we need to bring in tons of people together that we learn how to credit lots of people for the work that they do. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. I was very satisfied with what you said. Thanks, and uh, just remaining, right. oh, Andrew. All right, well, sorry if I make a mistake or something, um, but um, so you, you study electrical engineering and then you went to like machine learning or computer vision what made you decide to, because I, I Googled it and it, according to Google, it's, it's similar, but I didn't know. I didn't connect in my brain before you said it, but. Like, oh, yeah. oh how electrical engineering. Yeah, how you, jump, how you jump, like, was it a jump or was it not a jump at all? Like. It's a tiny jump. I'd tiny think. jump, okay. So uh, electrical engineering, there's lots of different kinds of electrical engineering. Uh, so I was kind of on the electrical engineering side that is more signal processing, uh, this, uh, you know, signal processing controls, low level, sig this kind of uh, stuff, information theory, the more the mathematical side of electrical engineering, less on the circuit side. I, it's pretty embarrassing what I would do with the circuit these days. But like um, the, yeah, so there, I was more on the mathy side of electrical engineering. In fact, I even event originally went into electrical engineering because I was doing work in a vision uh video processing laboratory and i was just like oh i like this work i like images 
what are all these graduate students studying? They were all studying electrical engineering. So I was like, okay, I guess to work with images, I have to be an electrical engineer. Uh, so there, uh, there is uh, people who work on imaging in many different areas, but I feel like um, uh, image processing, computer vision, like image processing usually lives more in electrical engineering and computer vision usually lives more in computer science, but they're really connected. And there's really, there's really, it's all very blurred. And so uh, for instance, my, uh, computer vision group at MIT was in the computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory, uh, but it, um, it was pretty much half electrical engineering students, half uh, CS students. Uh, yeah, so, and I think it's important that you uh, learn techniques from both areas. Andrew, are you a EE or are you a CS guy? CS. Well, I'm, I'm just optical engineer, like I'm an undergrad and stuff. Ah, cool. So I'm just, uh, I'm just here for fun. I don't know. So cool. with that, would like to thank Katie for graciously taking the time to speak to us today. I think, you know, the audience is very enthusiastic and it's a wonderful talk. So thank you so much for, for being here. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And I love uh, answering the questions and getting to talk with you guys. So Great. hopefully so, I get to meet you, some of you in person. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Professor. <laughs>